The Human Age, which is Diane Ackerman's latest book. Diane, please. Diane, how does science speak to your core of curiosity and meaning? Well, I don't actually think of it as science. I just think of it all as nature. So, um, and that's part of the revolution that's been taking place, is that we've been able to write about nature in the widest sense, so that it now, in addition to, I don't know, cornflowers and, and so on. So you're Squirrels. happy to be allowed to write about quarks. <laughs> I re I'm happy to be able to make my own astonishment and uh, follow my curiosity and be in a field now where you can just wake up one morning and say, I wonder why snails use love darts and just run with it and write about it and find out. Why do snails <laughs> use love darts? Uh, since you brought it up. Uh, well, their sex organs are behind an ear, just for openers, so you get a good visual of this. And they pull these um, arrows, these darts, out of their quiver, I'll call it. And um, they're made of calcium, and they stab each other during foreplay. That's all I can tell you now for, you know, a, a PG audience. Romance. Yeah. I love it. Uh, Diane, why is this book so positive and joyful, because it, it really does describe how naughty we are as humans on the planet, uh, wrecking no, the place. Well, there's no doubt. We've created a lot of planetary chaos that we didn't mean to. But I think the didn't mean to part is very important. If you think about what we could do on purpose this time, that is also extraordinary. So I'm very much a realist about what we've done, not just to the planet, but to our own evolution as well in different ways, um, but also very optimistic because as I've been studying uh, what people have been doing all over the world, I've been finding that we really do have the tenacity and the talent and the ingenuity to be able to change the world again for the better this time, but we do have to get busy and wake up and start doing it. I don't think uh, in the past, in the previous century, we were very pessimistic as environmentalists. And we didn't get very far with people to get them motivated. I don't think paralyzing people with gloom and doom and fear is the way to go. Let me give you an example, or you hear an example, and some of you have probably already read passages like this, but uh, this is just something that is an absolute treasure uh, to read. Um, uh, offshore in Jamaica, you write, I once swam through a button collector's variety of vividly colored fish. Let's just savor that for a moment. And was so spellbound that one hand automatically touched my chest and my eyes teared. My guide's eyes questioned me through the fishbowl of his face mask. There was no way to mind that I wasn't hurt or frightened, but jubilant, merely glad to the brink of tears. How do you scuba sign wonder? And this led to a whole sort of rumination about tears in the ocean, and in fact, there's an ocean in me, and I'm looking at this coral reef, and only then do you describe that 20 years ago you saw that, and today it's what? It's quite bleached and, and dead today, the same, the same place. Well, this um, separation of ourselves from the rest of nature the, that primary story that we were living by, I think has gotten us into a lot of trouble. And it's not true. We now know that on the microscopic level, we are only ever in communication with the rest of the world. And that we only exist uh, through our senses in relation to, the, to nature and to each other. And that we're now creating um, an environment that rivals the natural environment, our, our human environment, in which we're kind of embedding nature. So I needed to look at everything in the largest picture. I, I've only ever been interested in both nature and human nature, and especially how they're related together. So this was an ideal opportunity to do that, to write about how our, our relationship with all the different facets of nature is changing. And you begin with uh, orangutans and iPads? Yes, because there is a program of apps for apes <laughs> in which um, orangutans 
around the world are being given iPads because they're very smart and they need mental enrichment. And uh, Dolphins using touch pads, that's in your book? Yeah, uh, I visited one, he Skypes, that's more than I can do. <laughs> that's great. You've got Peter Gabriel jamming with some apes. Well, that's true, and he is actually, uh, he's putting into motion the interspecies internet. Because heaven forbid we don't have the rest of the animals involved with our, you know, digital fantasies that we live oh, with. Oh, no, 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 don't, please. Yeah. Don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he wants um, other intelligent animals to be able to communicate with each other more openly and with us and, and so on. So, yes, um, I was looking into that as well. And, you know, you describe it as evolution in practice, that, that here we are as a part of a biosphere, an ecosystem, we're not the enemy of the ecosystem, look at the ways in which we are a part of the ecosystem, and that is... For good and bad. For good and bad, and that's... In a, that's both a, ways. Right, right. And um, that we are in not at all uh, doomed, although unfortunately that really is the message that we get through the media all the time, that we are an evil species, all of us, which just isn't true, and that um, we have irrevocably ruined the planet. And that isn't true either. The UN panel on climate change says that it's real, it's urgent, we need to tend to it immediately, but our, uh, the worst possible scenarios are not inevitable, that we have the talent and, and the capabilities to um, curb things. So the hardest part for me was not making the whole book about that, about climate change, and um, somehow finding a way to have, um, to integrate that with what's happening in uh, robotics and artificial intelligence and epigenetics and what we're learning medically now about ourselves. And for me, it was, it was waking up every single day and just being stunned by what I was learning. I love that. A quick final question, and that uh, would be, um, what do you think the responsibility of your readers is to understand science, or the readers of the future is to understand science in, in any significant way? Diane? Um, it's funny, as you were saying that, I was, I was thinking more what my responsibility is, our responsibility, mm -hmm. to help them um, discover the, the marvel and the mystery uh, that it surrounds us every day in a way that is so fascinating. They don't have to want to do science. I don't want to do science. I love the revelations of science and the big picture that it allows us to see ourselves in. And I think as much as anything that's, that falls on us.